Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, friends. And what a joy to be with you again on this Lord's Day. How very good and pleasant when we live in unity. It is like precious oil, like fresh morning dew. We gather here together with our hearts and voices raised to God who's the center of our unity and praise. I love this little introduction to worship here. Of course, it's from Psalm 133, a very easy psalm to memorize if you ever felt like memorizing a psalm. It also gets into a lot of what Paul says about how we're called together in one spirit to use our various gifts for one true good. For there's one spirit that calls us into the one unity that is the body of Christ. How very good and pleasant when we live in unity. It is like precious oil, like fresh morning dew. We gather here together with our hearts and voices raised to God who's the center of our unity and praise. If you're in a place where you can see the outside and toward a bright sunny area, why don't you do so or just close your eyes and imagine the last time you were able to be with people that you love, enjoying the things that you enjoy most, the things that inhabit your innermost prayers. You give thanks to God for these memories, these times. How very good and pleasant when we live in unity. It is like precious oil, like fresh morning dew. We gather here together with our hearts and voices raised to God who's the center of our unity and praise. Let's pray. We praise you, O God, because you are the God of every day, the God of every breath, the God of our eternity. We praise you because you reveal yourself in the love shared between people and peoples. We praise you because you let us catch glimpses of your presence in our activities, in our joys, and even in our sorrows. We praise you because you instill in us the assurance of your protection, an assurance which has allowed us to endure over the years and even in this current age. God, because you love us, we can set aside the hostilities that threaten to separate us. Your love frees us to extend our joy as well as bear another's pain. Your love is like a nest, a place carefully chosen, materials meticulously woven, guarded by your constant presence. Thank you for being the God you have promised to be, the God we needed you to be. Thank you for providing individuals throughout our faith journey many of whom bear only the title saint, those teachers, coaches, supporters, clerks, volunteers, moms and dads, those unnamed who keep us in their prayers. Praise be to God, according to your gracious name. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. No more crying there, we are going to see the King. No more crying there, we are going to see the King. No more crying there, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. No more dying there. We are gone to see the king. No more dying there. We are gone to see the king. No more dying there. We are gone to see the king. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We are gone to see the king. No more crying there. No more dying there. Only hope is there. Joy and laughter there. 
Come on, saints, let's get together. Where we're going to see the king soon and very soon. Soon and very soon. We're going to see the king. Come with me in prayer and song. We're going to see the king. <laughs> let's pray. Glorious God, through the resurrection of your Son, you have given us the fullest vision of your love, a promise kept. We admit, no, we do indeed confess that we have not remained faithful to your vision of love. Where we should have been proactive, we have been lazy. Where we should have spoken up for the weak, we have protected our own selves. When we have the opportunity to praise you, we accepted accolades instead for our own glory. Forgive us our sins, O God. Restore our hearts, reclaim our lives, and lift our faces again to see your light in your life. Let us celebrate the resurrection with a renewal of faith and direction led only by your Christ. We pray all these things in the assurance of your love, your majesty, and your forgiveness. In the name that is above all names, Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not with us. But when we confess our sins, God, who is merciful and just, will hear us in all righteousness and will forgive us of all of our sins. Dear ones, know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks be to God. Amen. The word comes to us today first from Acts and then from the Gospel of John. Let's ask God's hand over this time with the word. Precious Lord, before we could ever imagine time existing you had your word firmly in your grasp a mind that stretched all time and space and we O oh god are humbled that you find us right now in a particular space to receive your word thank you for loving us this much and lifting us so beautifully into your presence let your word ring as the very truth stemming from your mouth your word for all of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Acts chapter 1, verses 6 to 14. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and on a cloud, uh, rather, and, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount they called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they had entered the city, they went uh, to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All of these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. And then from John's Gospel. Uh, chapter 17, verses 1 to 11. After Jesus had spoken these words, they looked up to heaven and said, Father, rather he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory 
that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you, for the words that you uh, gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you have sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on the behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine. And I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but, are, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. Praise be to God for the hearing of his holy word and his blessing on this, our time together. For me, one of my great joys, uh, being a homeowner and having a place to do what I want in the yard and that kind of thing, has been attracting birds to our yard. In our home in Pennsylvania, we were on quite a roll for some time when it came to attracting birds. I remember the thrill, though, the first time that we were able to attract a pair of bluebirds to a homemade bluebird house. To many of you, I'm sure this is old hat, and, um, but for me, it was very new and very exciting. And I was kind of ridiculous about it. I would place a lawn chair out under this tree where I would sit with a pair of binoculars just to watch this pair of bluebirds flitting in and out of the house, going out and finding their building blocks to make their nest and after a while, once they had their nest properly built inside the house, then I noticed you only ever saw one at a time because one was always inside the nest taking care of a clutch of five eggs. And as the weeks went on, I carefully introduced myself to the bluebirds. They got used to seeing me. I would approach the birdhouse slowly, and finally I would lift up the side of the birdhouse and look at the eggs and even after some time, the, one of the birds, whichever one was there, the male or the female, wouldn't even get up and fly away. It'd just sit and wait for me to close the door again. That way, whenever the chicks arrived, it wouldn't be too traumatic when I took a peek at the chicks. Well, in time, all the chicks hatched, all five of them. And they were doing beautifully. Mom and Dad fussed at me, of course, whenever I went over to peek in at these little ones, but once I walked away, they just went back to their regular routine. Having paid attention to the calendar, I knew that the day was coming when the birds would finally fledge, that is, take their first flight. According to my research, they would fledge likely on this particular Friday. Well, this Friday came, and I watched, and I watched... I was sure that they would fledge. Well, no fledging. Then Saturday came. Again, I sat there and I watched and I watched. No fledge. Hmm. Wouldn't you know, they took their first flight while I was at church Sunday morning. I, <laughs> I admit I was a little disappointed when we arrived home and realized that I had missed their first flight. The book of Acts is a continuation of the Gospel of Luke. Many of you probably know that. Some of you knew it and forgot it. And for some of you, this is the first time you're hearing that bit of information. It's important information because unlike the letters to Paul, there's a prerequisite of, of sorts. There's an expectation that the reader is already familiar with what's going on in at least one Gospel. Some information that the reader already has when he's reading the gospel, or rather the, the book of Acts, includes the expectation that the Holy Spirit is going to be given to uh, believers, the fact that Jesus is a sign of the restoration of the kingdom of God, and that the disciples are assured a place in this kingdom. Knowing these things doesn't take away from the anxiety that the disciples are clearly feeling, the anxiety that Jesus himself anticipated prior to his arrest. There are many holes in the directions, a lot of margin for error. 
The school I attended one time was all about military planning and organization. Our instructor used the term nesting a lot. Imagine the imagery of Russian nesting dolls, he would, and he said, and he said, how does this course of action nest with your overall goals or your stated intentions? The disciples, or rather for the disciples, the overarching theme was the promised restoration of Israel. That is, God's people realizing their rightful nested place among the nations of the world. They had witnessed Jesus performing ministry. They watched him die on the cross. They watched him lay, get laid in the, gra uh, the grave. They, along with certain women, were witnesses to his resurrection every step of the way. They received assurance from Jesus that these things had to happen for the kingdom to be restored. That indeed all of this nested within God's plan of salvation. So here they are having witnessed all that Jesus told them they would witness, and they asked the only logical question, Jesus, is it time? To which Jesus essentially answers, when it's time, it's time. I remember hearing a story years ago of a young boy who stumbled across an old issue of Audubon magazine. Now, Audubon magazine is a, is a, is a bird-watching magazine. While paging through, he found an article about bluebirds. This young boy himself had never seen a bluebird, and he was fascinated by the brightly colored pictures in this article. At the bottom of the page, there was a footnote that read, For a simple birdhouse plan, turn to page 52. The boy's imagination went wild. What if I were to build a house and birds would move in there, lay eggs, and have baby bluebirds? The boy imagined that morning when those birds would finally take their first flight. And together, he and the birds would dance in the yard, celebrating life, celebrating living, and all the pieces of creation, providing joy to all other pieces of creation. Like I said, his imagination went wild. And even though the boy had very little support at home for his project, and even though he didn't have all the proper tools to create all the right angles and make the sides perfectly square, right to measurement, he found the materials he needed, and he built his birdhouse. By anyone else's standards, this house was a mess. But he figured the bird's not going to care if the roof is just the right angle or the corners aren't quite square. So he found a place in the yard, he placed it, and he waited. And eventually his efforts paid off. A pair of bluebirds moved in. Now he didn't think to build a pivoting side on the house so he could gain access to the inside. Even if he had thought of it, he might not have been able to include it. So he was just left to judge by the actions of the adult birds whether or not there were eggs and, of course, later on, baby chicks. Jesus told his disciples, It is not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will all be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Isn't that kind of like this boy and his birdhouse? The disciples have all the evidence of the establishment of the kingdom, just like the boy had all the uh, evidence of the establishment of the nest and the young. The time was coming when the Holy Spirit would be with the disciples. The time was coming when the boy would see the bluebirds take flight. If the disciples so chose, they could let their imaginations run wild and dance when the Spirit takes a hold of them, not unlike the boy who surely will dance when he sees his birds. The ascension of Jesus marks the beginning of what theologians long ago called the in-between time. We are in between the time when Jesus is physically on earth, they say. This time has been interpreted uh, in almost as many ways as there are peoples on earth. It's been described as a period of testing, like an open book test, the Bible being, of course, that book, and to test and see if we're using the source material correctly before the teacher returns. How well we do will determine whether or not we graduate in this theory. 
Others have said, well, look, Jesus conquered death and went to heaven to prepare a place for us. Our task is only to eat and drink and be merry, for tomorrow we may die, to borrow a line from Ecclesiastes. One can also interpret this in between time according to our lesson from John, where Jesus prays specifically for his disciples, his church, to become on earth what Jesus was while he was on earth. Jesus says in his prayer, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. The church is to become that which glorifies God while making the name of God known in the world. This in-between time, this time in between the times we'll see Jesus on earth, is neither a time for proving anything to God, nor a time strictly for our own enjoyment. It's a time for believers to share their joy and life in Christ and the life in the church with others. This is a season when young people all over the nation and the world hear words of encouragement in the form of graduation addresses, even while we're home on COVID. Whether the speech comes from a celebrity or a politician or a business leader, a fellow student, a theme permeates the majority of them. The theme of building. How the world ahead of you will or will not nest with who you have become. I heard a young man once give an address to his high school classmates. In his address, he commented how quickly the years flew by. He said, it was just yesterday when we were awkward and afraid. He said, now we feel ready to take on whatever is next. Then he said something that's hard for most of us to accept. He said, and I'm paraphrasing here. He said, we, who, we are who we are today through our relationships with our family and friends and also our relationships with our enemies. Now, he didn't dwell on that thought, and I don't think he should have, but I was amazed at the boldness and the truth of that statement. We are a product not only of how we grow from our closest, most loving relationships, but also how we respond and recover from other kinds of relationships. It's those relationships, those other relationships, that the apostles and Acts wanted to be saved from. Jesus himself prays protection for his followers from these kinds of relationships. Not to remove the enemy, but to witness to Jesus. We learn, do we not, that our most powerful enemies are not individuals or even groups of people. At some point we learn the difficult truth that most, the most powerful enemy is our own reluctance to live the life Jesus sets out before us. We tend to dwell on the things that just aren't right in our own eyes while we leave unspoken the one who is perfect for everything and everyone. That story in that Audubon magazine, or rather that Audubon story about the boy in his birdhouse doesn't include an ending. The ending is up to the reader's imagination. But having missed the joy of my own fledging, I choose to hope that that boy was able to dance in his yard as those birds came out in celebration of all of creation. I choose to hope that the fact that he didn't have the right tools or the right support didn't stop him from experiencing the fullness of life and then taking that fullness with them into whatever his next great thing is. In the same way, I choose to hope that even though we have yet to leave a safer world to the next generation, we, the church, bear enough witness to the love that we have in Jesus that our young people will feel emboldened to carry that love with them. Let's pray. Father, the love that calls the world to be formed and life to enter it into, enter into it, continues to be on display whenever any hand shows compassion and any heart offers comfort. Thank you for the words of assurance to those early followers. 
With the Spirit's help, may we recognize how our experiences are nested within your holy plan. And may we trust your guidance and protection from every enemy. Continue to build us up, dear Creator and Redeemer, into a strong cloud of witnesses to your loving faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, grace, mercy, and peace be with you. The love of Christ over come you with an amazing joy that all of those who rest inside your hearts with love find amazing blessing and if you're experiencing a time of sadness now for whatever reason I hope you reach out to someone who can be there to listen to share and to comfort there's nothing that we're asked to do alone we always have Christ we always have the church Never forget to continue to be the church Christ asks us to be. Peace be with you. Amen.